Okay, so on this video, I'm going to be talking about polygamy part two. I was going to do the endings of polygamy and the afterlife, but as I put together the material, that I had quite a bit for the afterlife, and I didn't want to really breeze through it quickly, so I decided to do a part three, which will be the next video I'll put out, and cover that specifically. So this is about the ending, plural, and I'll get to that in a minute, of polygamy. First of all, let's talk about some of the stats um, with polygamy. When, when the saints were in Utah, um, at the, the height of the practice of polygamy, if you include everyone, the, the, the men, the women, and the children together, um, the stats were, at the height was about 50% of the population in 1857, which was known as the Reformation uh, period when they were really focused on this. Uh, by 1870, it was down to about 25 to 30%. Over the entire time span that they were in Utah until the Manifesto, uh, statisticians have estimated around 15 to 20% of the population. So it varied widely by different towns as well. Orderville was... 60% that was one of the highest. Uh, Colville was uh, one of the lowest at about 6% as an example. Um, also, if you, if you take a look at the picture on the screen, this is often when you think about uh, polygamous, you'll think of uh, a huge number of wives, for example, uh, Brigham Young here. Uh, but this was not the typical uh, polygamist in Utah. In fact, um, two-thirds of those that were practicing polygamy, the men had two wives. Another 20% had three wives. Uh, so really only one in ten had more than three wives in the practice of polygamy. Um, also, they had very high uh, or very easy uh, divorce laws. It was the easiest in, in the entire United States. Uh, very liberal laws. If you remember when they were in Illinois, I talked about it in, this, in the last video, extremely difficult to get a divorce. Most on the frontier would not go through the legal steps because of the challenges and would and basically go by behavior in the community uh, to, to have a, a divorce. Um, so very liberal, and in fact, 10% of the polygamist uh, wives did actually divorce. Uh, they felt a lot of freedom uh, to, to change, and many of them actually would enter another polygamist relationship when they did divorce. Uh, the divorce rate of monogamous was at 1%, polygamous at 10%, so kind of interesting. Also, to give you an idea on the numbers, when I talked about uh, in the last video about Jacob too is one of the reasons for polygamy to raise up seed uh, unto the Lord. Um, and if you look, it was interesting in the face-to-face -face, um, uh, devotional that Elder Cook had as they launched uh, the new church history publication, Saints, from the Nauvoo Temple. They had some people there from the church history department. Matt Gross said the church history department has done a recent study that found as of today, 20% of the members of the church came as a result of uh, the practice of polygamy. I found that stunning. In fact, I was curious. I, I would love to see a stat of where this was 50 or 60 years ago uh, before the, the global expansion of the church and the dramatic uh, number of converts the last uh, half a century. In fact, it probably was at 40, maybe even 50 percent. So I would say it worked for, for that, uh, that, that purpose specifically. Okay, so um, who practiced polygamy? Um, if you will look at this slide from the Gospel Topics essay on LDS.org on plural marriage, it says, During the years that plural marriage was publicly taught, all Latter-day Saints were expected to accept the principle as a revelation from God. Not all, however, were expected to live it. Indeed, this system of marriage could not have been universal. Due to the ratio of men to women, church leaders viewed plural marriage as a command to the church generally, while recognizing that individuals who did not enter the, pr the practice could still stand approved of God. Women were free to choose their spouses, whether to enter into a polygamous or monogamous union, or whether to marry at all. Some men entered plural marriage because they were asked to do so by church leaders, while others initiated the process themselves. All were required to obtain the approval of church leaders before entering a plural marriage. A very key part in the Revelation that it was controlled through priesthood keys. Uh, my fourth great grandpa was one of the original uh, bishops here in the Salt Lake Valley, and uh, he was asked to practice polygamy and declined. He did not want to do it. Uh, uh, his son uh, was, was uh, one of those asked to help settle the frontier down in southern Utah. Uh, Canaraville was where he was, and he did take on a second wife as he went down there uh, and practice. And he was a bishop in, in the Canaraville area down there. So different uh, uh, things happened there along the way. So um, let's talk about the laws that came about and why polygamy um, 
the manifesto came in 1890. What led up to that? So first of all, in 1856, the Republican Party, part of, partially, uh, part of their platform was um, to take on slavery and polygamy. They called them the twin relics of barbarism. And uh, that was part, part of the, the first uh, shot at, at, at polygamy. And then some laws that, that came about. If you look at the screen here, um, in 1862, Congress passed the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act, which made practicing polygamy a felony. However, the law was full of loopholes and didn't hold any weight in the Latter-day Saint-dominated Utah courts. So, in 1874, the government resolved that judicial loophole with the Poland Act. Now, this law stated that all polygamy cases would be tried in federal courts with federally appointed judges. This way, the Latter-day the Latter Saint judges or juries couldn't just dismiss the cases. Now, along the way, the church uh, members were still practicing polygamy and pa practicing civil disobedience in a sense, but they believed it was part of their First Amendment rights, the freedom of religion, to practice your religion. So in 1879, the church had challenged this in the Supreme Court. It was uh, held up as constitutional. Um, and then there was a, uh, in 1882, because in eight, the, uh, the last act, um, you had to prove that a marriage happened, essentially witnesses. So it was, again, very challenging. So in 1882, they started to put some teeth in this. The Edmonds Act made an unlawful cohabitation a crime. And anyone who broke the law could be imprisoned for six months. Unlawful cohabitation was a much easier judicial standard to prove than bigamy or polygamy because prosecutors didn't have to provide evidence of a marriage. So then the big one was the Edmonds Tucker Act, 1887. And at this point, in 1885 to 1889, uh, most of the apostles, state presidents, they were either in hiding or in prison. It was an extremely challenging time, what was beginning to happen. And this specific act is really what was the final nail in the coffin of polygamy. This act accomplished three things. Number one, it disenfranchised, took the vote away from all the women in Utah and polygamous men. That was a big deal. Utah was actually the second state to allow um, voting. Uh, uh, they, they, they could, uh, if, uh, Wyoming was the first in 1869, Utah was in 1870. Um, in fact, uh, many that were against polygamy thought the women would rise up uh, if they gave them the vote. And in fact, they did just the opposite. Uh, they rallied around uh, polygamy. Um, but they took that away. Uh, two, they froze the assets of the church uh, in excess of 50,000, basically bankrupting the church and crippling its missionary efforts. And third, it declared all children of plural marriages to be illegitimate in the eyes of the government. This was then challenged in the Supreme Court, and in 1890, it was uh, held up to be constitutional. That is what led to um, Wilford Woodruff praying heavily about the manifesto, uh, the, 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 the issuing of the manifesto. And this was extremely challenging, but he had a vision of where the church would end up uh, with this. And the Lord even said, to talk to the people, the Latter-day Saints, and, sh and share with them this question. Uh, with 60 million people against us, um, we are going to lose everything, all the temples, the, uh, the, all of the uh, men, the leaders of the church, everyone will be imprisoned, and polygamy will be stopped uh, in the end. Or we can stop it now through a manifesto and be able to keep all these things. And that was how the Lord asked Wilford Woodruff, essentially, to share this with the church. Very interesting. Um, and the, the actual manifesto was, was somewhat of a press release, the way it is, and it, was, it had some ambiguity. It didn't really have, have a manual with it of how to go about this, and how, what about if you were already in polygamous relationships? Um, and listen to the last uh, sentence of this. Um, he's, uh, Wilford Woodruff, President Woodruff, and now I publicly declare that my advice to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriage forbidden by the law of the land. So some saints viewed this as uh, political expediency. Uh, it did help Utah to become a state, uh, but they didn't feel like necessarily maybe this was still God's law and it trumped the law of the land. So some still practice it. It went down significantly, and a lot of the marriages that happened were down in Mexico during this time period, but some did still happen. Uh, it is interesting to see what Wilford Woodruff, uh, so there was a, some excerpts in the manifesto uh, that they put, and this is actually in their canonized scriptures here, some excerpts from three addresses by Wilford Woodruff. And this is where we get that famous line that many have memorized from Wilford Woodruff. Uh, he says, the Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place.
there. And I think Wilfred Woodard felt like he really needed to say this now with this big, big change on deck uh, there. And then if you look on the screen here, something that he did publish as part of the excerpts here, he says, I should, ha I should have let all the temples go out of our hands. I should have gone to prison myself and let every other man go there, had not the God of heaven commanded me to do what I did do. And when the hour came that I was commanded to do that, it was all clear to me. I went before the Lord and I wrote what the Lord told me to write. So as we go on, uh, what then happens in very challenging situations politically, uh, the first senator that was elected was B.H. Roberts uh, to the Senate, and we had tremendous problems um, there. He actually was not seated. There was a um, seven million signatures in our country to protest B.H. Roberts being um, uh, seated as a senator, even though we were state, because he was a polygamist. And he did take on one wife after the manifesto uh, was, was executed. And so it was a big fear in the country uh, back then. So that was in 1898. 1902, uh, Reed Smoot uh, is elected senator. And he uh, is a monogamist. But after what happened with Reed Smoot and, the, and many uh, uh, countrymen uh, throughout the, the United States uh, not believing the church uh, as far as um, them not practicing polygamy now, they had four years of hearings with Reed Smoot, and it was just brutal, gut-wrenching. Um, Joseph F. Smith, the prophet at that time in 1904, came and testified before Congress, and um, after that, he said that he was going to put out a second manifesto, and this was a watershed moment for the church. This is where really um, the true deadline, if you will, for uh, practicing the living came about. Uh, here, if you look on the screen, this is from the Gospel Topics essay on plural marriage. In this legal setting, President Smith sought to protect the church while stating the truth. His testimony conveyed a distinction church leaders had long understood. The manifesto removed the divine command for the church collectively to sustain and defend plural marriage. It had not, up to this time, prohibited individuals from continuing to practice or perform plural marriage as a matter of religious conscience. During his Senate testimony, President Smith pro promised publicly to clarify the church's position about plural marriage. At the April 1904 General Conference, President Smith issued a forceful statement known as the Second Manifesto, attaching penalties to entering into plural marriage. If any officer or member of the church shall assume to solemnize or enter into any such marriage, he will be deemed in transgression against the church and will be liable to be dealt with according to the rules and regulations thereof and excommunicated therefrom. This statement had been approved by the leading councils of the church and was unanimously sustained at the conference as authoritative and binding on the church. The Second Manifesto Manifesto was a watershed event. For the first time, church members were put on notice that new plural marriages stood unapproved by God and the church. So this was a this was a very big deal. Two of the twelve were actually dropped for for performing plural marriages. One of them was actually excommunicated. The other disfellowship for performing plural marriages after this second manifesto. Um, so I didn't actually get a chance. I was going to put together a little visual. I love how. Um, Brian Hales at a Fair Mormon conference uh, had a great visual just showing this timeline of polygamy practiced in the church. So if you can envision this, um, from 1834 to 1852, polygamy was permitted in the church. From 1852 in Utah to 1890, polygamy was actually commanded. Um, and, and you can go back to, you know, not, it wasn't commanded for everyone to practice, but it was commanded on the church level there. Um, from 1890 to 1904, polygamy was again permitted. And if you think about it, the Lord is so merciful. This was gut-wrenching, very challenging. Wait till I talk about that in the next video about this Abrahamic sacrifice and would we would be required to do this in, in the afterlife necessarily. Um, and so uh, you think about how structurally challenging and culturally in society to do something like this. The Lord allowed it to phase in and to phase out. And I think that's very merciful. Now, um, if we, the thing I wanted to, to finish with on this was um, polygamists today and where they trace their roots back um, to these some critical events during this, this time frame here. So in 1886, supposedly uh, John Taylor and, uh, had a, uh, a special meeting with a group of 13 that was eight hours long. It was on September 27, 1886. 
And in this meeting, supposedly he said he had a vision that the polygamy was to can carry on and continue on forward, even outside the church if it had to be, to continue forward. Um, and he even set apart supposedly five people to, to ensure that this was able to, to carry on, even if it had to go outside the church. And this was, this was the key crux that they leaned back to, is that these keys went outside the church structure. Um, on here. Now there's some real challenges to this and in the book uh, Persistence of Polygamy if you uh, look at the screen here, I actually just took a screenshot of this page, I thought it was fascinating. Um, if you um, look at these 13 people that were at that meeting, the five in the middle there that's kind of the grayed out box uh, there, those were the five that were set apart. And let's look at their behavior, the actual behavior. How many of these men took upon themselves plural wives, after the manifesto. If you look at the, it's all zeros, none of them. Um, if you go uh, past the second manifesto, none of them uh, took on sec a second wife, except for one, Lauren Woolley. And if you look, who reported that there was this special uh, meeting that took place? And there may have been a meeting, there may have even been a revelation that for John Taylor to continue uh, forward and, and, and rally around uh, practicing polygamy for the t at that time in 1886. But look at the date, 1912. This is 26 years after the event, and he was the one that took on a wife after the Second Manifesto. They're very interesting. None of the others, there's one other, and for, it was 43 years later, uh, Daniel Bateman uh, talked about this, this uh, meeting that John Taylor had. But there's a much more uh, critical uh, measure here that I would say, and it's following the living prophet. And if you think about it, this this principle here that, uh, and I love what Dallin H. Oak said in this BYU devotional in June of 1992, the most important difference between dead prophets and living ones is that those who are dead are not here to receive and declare the Lord's latest words to his people. If they were, there would be no differences among the messages of the prophets. So this continued to be a challenge for several decades, and in 1933, uh, Heber J. Grant actually issued a third or final manifesto, as some call, very strong wording, and actually it required a loyalty pledge for those that were viewed as, as potentially practicing polygamy. If they did not sign this loyalty pledge, they were excommunicated. Uh, and this is actually where the fundamentalist groups um, got their start, the two big groups, so the AUB, the Apostolic United Brethren, and the FLDS uh, today. And there's, we estimate, maybe 30 to 60,000 uh, people still practicing today in those uh, two groups. So that's where they tie back to. But what a great principle for us. Uh, the keys uh, are with the living prophet. Um, and I hope this video was helpful. And we'll look forward to the next one about uh, practicing polygamy in the afterlife.